I'm Kat. And I'm Haley. And this is Night Classy. A tipsy night class teaching the oddities and curiosities you never learned in school. What are we drinking for this learning journey, Haley? We have quite the spread. I've mixed my Taco Bell mango freeze with my mango Ciroc. And you have simply spiked lemonade. I do. I'm working on a plain flavor and I have a watermelon next how does in it line. Com- how does it compare to White Claw? Um, we've already talked about this, but I guess when I oh. had it last time, you weren't here. That was when you were in Ohio. Oh, So right. you didn't get to taste it. It basically didn't happen. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, that was a blur. But yeah, I like it. I think I like it better than White Claw. It's a little more fun. I don't know. Yeah, I like the way it's marketed too. Like if it didn't explicitly say spiked, I could easily see somebody grabbing one of these and being like, whoa, I feel... <laughs> Feel a little spicy. (laughs) Have I ever told you the story about my Mormon soccer coach and how he accidentally got drunk on Mike's Hard Lemonade? (laughs) Oh my God. You didn't know what Mike's Hard Lemonade is? No. It was, well, it was back, it was a long time ago. I was probably like 10 or 11. So maybe it had just come out, but he was also, he was also from the UK. So he a Mormon from the UK. Yeah, apparently they exist. Um Very so he was staying at our house and it was like before soccer practice. Like he <laughs> we were leaving for soccer practice in like an hour and my mom had told him like just help yourself from any, like to anything from the fridge and he just starts pounding these Mike's hard lemonades. He's like why are these so good? Yeah. I feel invincible. <laughs> he was. He was like this is the best lemonade I've ever had. Like this is so good. And I remember just like watching him. I don't know if my mom like was there. I feel like she would have said something or maybe she was just like, okay, like I guess like he's not a serious Mormon. Um, (laughs) But yeah, he got drunk and it wasn't until like the end, like when it was time to go to practice that like I think his friend, because we had a second guy staying with us, Danny, and he told him that they had alcohol in them after he let him drink like four <gasps> of them. That's rude. Yeah, that's, it was pretty that's mean. Wrong. <laughs> they, he, he had a good attitude about it, but yeah, he got buzzed probably for the first time ever. What if that's just his thing? He just like accidentally. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that's smart. <laughs> that yeah. is smart. Or just like don't read the label. Like kind of like when I was vegan and I'd be like, you know, like I know this probably has like casein powder in it or whatever. But like if you don't read the label, then how you can are, just how pretend. You know? Just pretend yes. it's vegan. <laughs> <laughs> Did he go to soccer practice? Yeah, he wasn't like wasted, but he'd had, it. A, he'd had like three or four Mike's Hard Lemonade. So, you know. So he was having a good time he probably it was probably the best soccer practice of his life I mean he had to deal with like 20 11 year old girls in the 90 degree summer so yeah he needed it it's his new warm-up yeah that's what he does <laughs> now <laughs> but he just kept saying this is the best lemonade I've ever had and so it makes me think of oh but yeah God. these are these are good and these are better than Mike's hard lemonades are they the I think. best lemonade you've ever had my earring just straight up fell out of my ear <laughs> you know what I can't recall a lemonade I like more so maybe Wow. Wow. Yeah. The best lemonade she's ever had. I mean, I think so. I don't think... Have you ever had real homemade lemonade? Yeah, my grandma used to make it. Is it good? Yeah, it's fine. I don't, I'm okay. not a big lemonade person. Citrus yeah. things have grown on me in my adult years, so it's hard to be a judge, yeah. that kind of thing. I always uh, liked the Crystal Light lemonade. I'm oh, a big okay. Fan. Yeah, the powder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's I better loved- than country time watching people make it i have no opinion you liked on watching people yeah make it. the what way the powder about? like just <laughs> it gets really wet at first and then it just disperses you know mm. and you stir it up yeah kind of like when you pour creamer into iced coffee and you can watch it swirl around yes it's good times. oh my gosh the amount of times i've tried to make a boomerang of me <laughs> at a restaurant pouring cream into a coffee and to see the effect and there's just way too much cream because i'm paying attention to the boomerang and not to my coffee look i I've been there with you yeah. while this exact scenario happens yes. multiple times. And yeah, it always you always over cream it. I'm done with boomerang. <laughs> I'm always over creaming it. But now what I do is I put the creamer in first and my coffee at home. So I don't oh, even have to stir it. That's look at you yes. thinking outside the box. It only took 50 times of <laughs> over creaming it. <laughs> I've never thought of that. And yeah. I don't know why isn't that. I guess it's kind of like putting the cereal before the milk because then like it's like, OK, I I, like I feel like you have to adjust the amount of creamer to how much coffee you have. Yeah, but once 
you get to know yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Once you have the experience under your belt, you can take these kinds of risks. This, this is true. This is true. <laughs> the other day was way too much. So I was like, I guess I'm drinking milk. <laughs> oh, gross. <laughs> I've been really, I already told you about this, but just for our listeners, because I'm trying to spread the gospel, but Trader Joe's has an instant cold brew powder. Oh, and it's so my God. good. I need That's to go. I've been drinking. I'm going to um, try and participate in no by July, at the very least, not buying anything July 3rd through July 5th. Yes. Um, but I'm going to try and go for the full month. I didn't realize it was not buying anything. I thought we just weren't buying gas. No, we're not buying shit. Not buying shit. We're not buying shit. All right. I can definitely do that because I don't leave my house anyway. Yeah. And but I'm, I'm not like, <laughs> celebrating the 4th of July. So I'll be in my we'll living be hanging room playing out. Mario Kart. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try and buy. I need to get gas today and I need to get coffee grounds today. Yeah. Or at least before Friday. Yeah. Um, but after that. No buy, Haley. For three days. <laughs> I don't know if we can handle it. I'm trying to go the whole month oh. because, A, I should be saving You're more gonna money. You're going to go all of July without buying anything? Well, probably not How's anything. That, that's not possible. I'm going to buy groceries and like okay. necessities, but unless, okay. I, like, no more Amazon shopping sprees. Fair. None of that. Fair. <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've been on that train as well, although I did buy a pair of shoes to wear to the wedding, finally. We talked about this on the pod before. Did you get the, sh- the shoes you showed me? I think so. The ones with the butterflies on them. Yes. Yeah. I'm very excited. I got, like, these little gold, like, heels, chunky heels with like little gold butterflies all over. They're so cute, you guys. This is like what... One thing I love about being an adult is that you get to do and buy things that you couldn't do and buy as a kid. Yeah, they look like toddler shoes. And they're definitely like shoes I would have wanted to wear as a wedding as a kid. And my mom would have told me no. And got me like some like white patent leather Mary Janes. And... I'm an adult, so I got to buy them. Hopefully, they'll be here in time. They just shipped yesterday from China, so we'll see. I don't have much faith, but then I get to buy a second (laughs) pair of shoes if they don't get here on time. So it's okay. Okay, okay. Well, I'm glad you found your shoes. Yes. Um, Do we have any other things before I move on to our announcements? Um, Are you going to announce cocktail hour? Is that... You announce cocktail okay. hour, I'll announce the other thing. All right, we got it all planned out. <laughs> Guys, we're so proactive. So proactive. Oh, actually, shit. We shouldn't announce cocktail hour because it, this episode isn't coming out until next week. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Uh, so cocktail hour already happened. Hopefully it was fun. I'm sure it was. <laughs> um, but we do ha- actually have an upcoming cocktail hour. Check us out August 5th, oh. the first Friday of the month. Every first Friday of the month, (laughs) 7 p.m. on Patreon. So if you want to hang out with us and our other, um, what is the new tier? It's the night class. Night classologists. Yeah. I still don't remember where that came from, but. It came from Alex Brain. No, you guys coined it. I think Haley coined it. Did I? (laughs) <laughs> that could be true. I don't remember I, almost anything. I don't, I never know. Alec writes stuff down, and if he didn't do that, I wouldn't know anything ever. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah. Guys, last last episode, he for the notes, he helps us write our show notes. It's just pictures. It's just doodles. Yeah, he used <laughs> to take notes for us, and then now he just draws us pictures of stuff that doesn't even yeah, have to I do with the Alcatraz. episode. Alcatraz. <laughs> yeah, so that was really helpful. Well, the thing was, we had a catastrophic tech failure that distracted me from the notes. And once I felt like we'd gotten too deep, I bailed on the notes. You yeah. sure did. You sure did. But that's okay. <laughs> no pictures this week, please. <laughs> He'll be on his best behavior. Anyway, what are your announcements? Trying to feel valued. <laughs> Well, I want to announce our newest night cat. That's our Patreon tier, Miss Haley Wexler May. Thank you for upping your Patreon Whoa. tier. I hope you're enjoying the uh, trivia nights. Oh, Those so are fun. The best to record. So I'm sure you all hopefully have fun listening to them. Um, and Haley's been with us for a little while now, um, and she has an awesome name. So thank you, Haley. I didn't even give her a chance to say what she wanted us to announce on the show. So Haley, if you have anything else you'd like to add, just message me. <laughs> <laughs> and she does get to pick a topic. So we should have two Patreon pick topics coming up soon. Yeah, coming right up. Um, On a more serious note, do you have any more topics? No. Okay. Donate to Planned Parenthood. 
right now. I'm going to put the link in the show notes. Um, donate there and yeah, protect women's rights because everything is fucked up right now. And I don't know what will be happening in two weeks when this comes out, uh, but it probably won't be getting better for a long time. So please donate, protest, do whatever you can do. Yeah. I mean, I went through such a, I was thinking this week, like maybe I should try and do something related to the current events and the overturning of Roe v. Wade. But I was like, I don't know if I want this episode to be like leaning into that because I've been depresso espresso. Yeah. It just like (laughs) sucks. And I mean, like we're all dealing with this, especially if you're a person with a uterus. So you know, deal with it however you see fit in a way that's healthy for you, um, but do something. And if that is just making a post on social media or making a $5 donation to Planned Parenthood, it's better than nothing. Um, we should all do our part. And Planned Parenthood is really cool. I've donated for a long time. You can set up reoccurring donations. So like you can just donate like $5 a month. Like I do it. I don't even notice it. Um, and I plan on increasing that. So right. And if you do no by July or no by for three <laughs> days, then take that money that you would have gotten yeah. um, Taco Bell or whatever. Send it over to um, where it's actually going to do some good. Definitely. Um, Thank so, you for that yeah, announcement. Of course. And are we ready? We are ready. Okay. Well, we breathalyzed. I blew a point zero two eight, And I blew a point zero four zero. So... Yes. All feeling right, well. good actually I don't even feel different at all but I'm sure it'll <laughs> it will kick in <laughs> and as I said earlier I've been feeling really down and just doom scrolling and mm-hmm. everything is about Roe v Wade yeah so this story I realized like an hour before we started recording is very it's like in the same vein as last week's lesson so what I do was apologize it was Alcatraz okay. because I just finished some notes that I had started a while ago gotcha. for this lesson because I just couldn't make myself do anything. Yeah. So I felt the same way. And I picked a topic that like is from my list of other people suggesting it. Cause like, this is also a suggestion. Was, oh, good. Yes. Yeah. Cause I feel like, again, we always say it, the hardest part is picking a lesson. So that at least cut out <laughs> that took down a, a whole barrier. lot of the work. <laughs> yeah. So I apologize if you don't like these types of stories. Um, let's get too into bad. it. <laughs> yeah, too bad. I hope I get to draw another thing like Alcatraz. <laughs> don't draw yeah. I'm, I'm writing the notes this week and I want no actually you do some, need to draw reference. because if I have to do a no segment on pictures you have to do a note segment on pictures it's he just draws fair. a little graphic novel over there for the people that don't understand I take notes and then they take turns writing the show notes for each episode. So that's yeah. why it makes it difficult when I only draw pictures. But you know, <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> the good thing about pictures, though, is that I can actually see what you're um, saying, I guess. Or what oh, you're- <laughs> yeah, because my handwriting is illegible. I need to switch to a laptop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. Well, anyway, let's get into this lesson, this learning journey, if you will. Do you recognize the name Rockefeller? No. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, okay. <laughs> we all recognize the name Rockefeller, even if you're lying. Michael Rockefeller was John D. Rockefeller's great grandson and the youngest son of Nelson Rockefeller, New York's governor and eventually the vice president. Today, we're learning about Michael Rockefeller's disappearance, which is still technically unsolved and the theories surrounding it. Ooh. Have you heard this before? I think I've listened to like a podcast episode about it, but I don't remember anything. It was really, it had like, this story had blown up a couple months ago. Okay. And that's why I waited on telling it. So it just kind of worked out. So hopefully everyone's not Michael Rockefellered out. (laughs) (laughs) Michael was born in 1938 and was a part of this multimillionaire dynasty thanks to great granddaddy founding the oil company. Michael's father wanted Michael to help him manage the family's empire, but Michael was more of the artsy type. He did go to Harvard and graduated in 1960, but the idea of corporate America sounded less than ideal. Having grown up around his father's fine art, 
Michael knew that he wanted to learn more about indigenous art, specifically that of Nigerians, Aztecs, and the Mayans. So when he graduated, Michael took a position on the board of his dad's museum. Because nepotism. Yeah. Just, uh, oh, I like art. Let me just hand you a board membership. Like you're on the board. That's insane. It pays, baby. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) I want to be a nepotism, baby. (laughs) Me too. Uh, Sounds so Where's my dad? Dad, give me a... A job. Please. (laughs) But don't make me do work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's That's true. That's true. (laughs) I just want to, like, rearrange things. I could could be on the board of an art museum. I'd just be like, put this over there. Right. Just, (laughs) I imagine these people just, like, strolling around the art museum, pretending they're important. Right? Like, for sure. What else? If they even go through the art museum, right? Like, they may just be at home or in an office just... I don't yeah. know what they, they might what just be borrowing art from the museum to put in their own office. If you're a millionaire, what do you do? Yeah, I don't understand all these like boards. <laughs> <laughs> all these boards. Being on like the board of like the country club. Are we or, talking I don't game know. boards? So what is this? <laughs> Monopoly. Sorry. I Uno. do like chess. <laughs> do you? That's I news do. to me. Not chess, checkers. Oh, that makes more sense. <laughs> checkers. Carl Heider who worked with Michael said that he quote wanted to do something that hadn't been done before and bring a major collection to New York. So he had these huge ambitions that hadn't been done before bringing art to New York, bringing art, but different art, different art growing up, disgustingly rich. Michael had already traveled extensively and had lived in Japan and Venezuela for months at a time, but he also wanted to personally experience something totally new to him and rare to others. That's why Michael connected with the Dutch National Museum of Ethnology and planned a scouting trip to what was known as Dutch New Guinea, an island off the coast of Australia. His goal was to come back with art from the indigenous Asmat people. By then, the Dutch had been occupying this island, and although it was, they did have a lot of missionaries there, not many had interacted or stayed long with the Asmat people. They had little to no contact with people outside of their community. The Asmat people were extremely cautious of the outside world, and they believed that anyone not on their island was inhabited by spirits, and they were seen as supernatural beings. Basically, their whole world was dictated by spirits. They inhabited the trees, whirlpools, even their own fingerprints, and they felt their nostrils were spirits of their own. Ooh, that's cool. I know. I can definitely (laughs) see spirits in the trees and the whirlpools. I don't want to think about them in my nostrils. I mean, we have, like, little mites and stuff. That's true. Maybe, like... They have, uh, never mind. This, this sounds rude. Spirit. I was just thinking like a living thing is already in my nostrils. Why can't there also be a spirit? But that was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I see where you're going with that. You? Everything is spirit. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It's, I mean, we have bacteria. We have all these little cells. Yeah. It's just I mean, spirits. like we're covered in other living life. Why not it's spirits too? Labels. <laughs> my hair has a spirit of its own, let me tell you. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Your hair looks good today, though. Oh, thank you. Long and luscious. Oh, I ordered new extensions. Okay. Side tangent. <laughs> because my other ones were so thin and disgusting. I want to see them. What are you going to do with them? I'm going to put should... them on my head. The my bad hair. ones? No, no. You should make another hair art. Actually, I was thinking about that. Mm-hmm. I was like, surely there will be people on like Etsy who would buy them. Oh, for sure. Yeah. That's actually one of my summer goals. Do it. So check out my Etsy when I make it. Anyway, back to the spirits. Everyone could, um, of the asthma people, everyone could see them and talk to them. And they believe that everything happened at the will of the spirits. When Michael and the researchers and documentarians arrived at the village of Otschenep, they were not welcome with open arms. What did they think was going to happen? I don't know. I feel like Michael went there thinking that he could just buy his way into anything because I, it seems like yeah. that's how his whole life had been. Yeah. The Asmat people allowed photography, but disallowed any purchasing of their cultural artifacts. And Michael was actually amazed by that. 
he was fascinated by their lack of Western societal norms and the artifacts being something that he could not simply buy made him want them so much more. Yeah, I fucking bet. <laughs> Imagine having so much money you can have literally whatever you want. Literally anything. And then and you're, you're told, like, oh, you can't have this. Of course he wanted it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and at the time, um, also a little more background on the Azmat people. It wasn't uncommon for villages to battle each other. They would also just do it ritualistically, even if it, there wasn't a feud going on. And when this happened, Michael learned that the Azmat warriors were literally headhunters. They would take the heads of the enemy, eat their brain, and um, skin them, and use their bones for their, the weapons. So they really used every single part of any of the deceased in these battles or wars. And in some regions, the men would engage in ritualistic homosexual sex and would sometimes drink each other's urine. Michael was in complete awe of these people and just wanted to know more about them and wanted their artifacts so bad. Okay. <laughs> On the island, people traveled by the rivers. There were no wheels, steel, iron, no paper, no cell phone towers, nothing like that started even arriving until the 1960s. It was all just vibes and spirits. <laughs> When the first scouting mission came to a close, Michael was more excited than ever. Despite walking away with no art, no artifacts, he created a plan to create an anthropological study of the Azmat people and display their art in Daddy's museum. So, he's so not they told up. him, "No, you can't have our art," and he said, "I'll be back." I'll bet, yeah. <laughs> what a fucking douche. Yep, yep. <laughs> Michael went to New Guinea again in October 1961 with Renee Wassing, a government anthropologist. He brought hordes of trading materials, steel axes, fishing line and hook, cloth, and tobacco, which the Azmat people loved their tobacco. Two Azmat teenagers also accompanied them to 13 villages over a three-week time period. And if, if you told everyone, you can't have this, I'm, no amount of money can buy it. And they said they wanted it anyway, and then came to you with trading goods, like stuff you wanted... What do you think they you, they would bring you? Oh my goodness! Um, probably chocolate. Probably okay. a gray cat. Oh yes. Um, probably hair extensions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know what else. Okay, those what, are good things. What do you think they would bring you? Um, I don't know. Definitely reusable straws. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, a horse <laughs> and <laughs> wow, you're, you're trading it all. <laughs> uh, you know what? Maybe like the horse tack is always in boring colors. I want someone to give me a sparkly pink saddle. Pretty sure that doesn't exist. So if I'm, someone brought that to me, I would be very thankful and I'd give them whatever they wanted. I bet it does. Would you even want a horse? Would you need a horse and the pink bedazzled? Yeah. And I don't want it to be bedazzled. It needs oh, to oh. have glitter in it. Oh. Like embedded. it needs to be made of yeah. like vinyl. A part of the DNA. Like upholstered in like pink sparkly <laughs> vinyl. <laughs> All right, y'all. You heard it here. Cat will give it up for. <laughs> I love the leap Lots from a straw to a horse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Trade for, I don't Those know, are the two uh, most a important things. <laughs> <laughs> also, so embarrassing, but it's, no, tr it's I, true. <laughs> I love it. I mean, you can buy these straws, Kat. That's true. I can afford them. Um, <laughs> what would you refuse to sell? <laughs> what would I refuse to Michael? To? Um, ghosty. Yeah, my cats, mm -hmm. probably. What would you refuse to sell? Probably like my journals. Mm. I think I'd sell anything except for my cat. But maybe for the right price. Oh, and I wouldn't sell Georgia. Into it. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't yeah. sell my dog. Yeah. No pets. I can't think of anything else that I'd be so tied to. Yeah. What if I, I was like, I won't sell my artifacts? You're just like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Eventually, your journals will be artifacts. That's if they're true. Yeah. Around long enough. That's true. You're like, my artifacts. And then you clutch like your night classy doodles that you draw. <laughs> Yeah, 3,000 years from now, they're going to be like, we found a new language. <laughs> 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 
some indecipherable. Type of hieroglyphics. We, we need a Rosetta Stone. <laughs> okay. So, turns out there were some things that the Azmat people would trade for. And that was the tobacco, the fishing line and hooks, the cloth, and their steel axes. So he, he traded all of those things. He was able to obtain bulls, bamboo horns, spears, paddles, and shields. So he's super happy. About three weeks go by, mid-November, they return to um, a separate island, Agats, to get more supplies for trading. On their way back to Azmat, it was... Anything but smooth sailing. Their catamaran capsized, and they were not super close to the shore, approximately 12 miles away. And I looked it up. I did some research on top of research. It takes about 30 minutes to swim one mile in open water. If you don't drown, which I definitely would. Right. I can swim, but I'm not fucking with open water. I can barely swim across a pool. Really? Yeah. I would definitely I didn't drown know that. immediately. You know, <laughs> you don't come off as someone who can. You just always talk so confidently about <laughs> the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Do I? But yeah, no. I don't. I don't float, and so like if I'm not paddling, I'm sinking. You're going so as down. soon as I get tired. <laughs> goodbye. Can I share a quick swimming open water story? Yes, please. Okay, so I was like. Falling asleep, but I just open my phone to like do one last little browse. I open YouTube and it automatically plays a YouTube short. So it fills my whole screen. And it is a guy being eaten alive by a great white shark. What? In Australia. It really real? happened. And I was and like. it's on YouTube? I was like in shock. I was like, oh my God. And there's just a guy filming it like, that guy got eaten by a shark. And the uh, it's like thrashing around and the water's all red. And I was like, <gasps> oh my God, I have PTSD. But then, of course, out of curiosity, I go on Reddit and I'm like, the rest of the video. I watched the rest of the video. Why? And it was not good. Oh my God. That's why you should stay on TikTok. The dingo took our man, baby. But I love the ocean and now I'm scared. Yeah, that's really that freaking really scary. I can't believe scary. you watched the whole video. Why? Yeah, why he was you training. Why? He was training for a big, like, open water swim that was going to happen in that same coast, like, two weeks from then. And the. 16 foot great white shark they haven't had an attack since 1960 it comes up straight from under him shoots him into the sky and then comes down on him and he's like <gasps> screaming for help have any stuff. scientists weighed in like why do they think it well he was wearing him? a black wetsuit so they think that it just, it just thought, thought it was, it was a seal, seal and that it like i don't know if the predation is increasing because they yeah. have no fish to eat anymore yeah that's what i was wondering because they don't normally do that right yeah but it shook me up i like yeah, couldn't fall asleep all I'd be night shook too yeah i can't why would you watch the whole thing? <laughs> yeah you couldn't sleep the universe was like oh you want to be able to not sleep i'll show you not being able to sleep <laughs> yeah and if you're listening don't look up the video you don't want to see it you'll never get in the water again yeah yeah no thanks so sorry i had to bring that up but lakes no, only I'm, yeah lakes. i love a good lake i'll get in i'll mm. get in a lake i'm like more scared of lakes though because you can't see the bottom yeah i'm not trying to go and like swim swim in a lake okay. but i'll like i'll wade in the yeah. water there's also like I feel like stuff touches your leg more in a lake. I don't yeah. know. In my experience, I'm just more of a hang out in the shade kind of girl. <laughs> <laughs> That's Fair my enough. jam. One time when I was really little, I was uh, swimming in the lake and it was like off our boat, so it was deep water. And I'm swimming, 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 and then like a dead fish floats by me. And so I start swimming away, like freaked out. And then there's like a big like jumble of lake weed and it's full of dead fish oh. like a hundred oh. of them they were like teeny tiny head. dead fish and i just had a panic attack and i was splashing <laughs> and screaming <laughs> and it was probably the scariest moment of my life yeah i'd be <laughs> splashing and screaming and throwing up yeah and, and drowning probably eventually <laughs> yeah but i think that's what ruined swimming in water for me and I'll still do it, but I am scared. You got to check the water before masses of dead fish. Yeah, I just, I don't like dead things. They really freak me out. But you like the bones of dead things. If it, I choose to see them. If they right. if they surprise me, I do not. <laughs> fair enough, fair yeah. enough. 
back to the learning Sorry. journey. No, I love the <laughs> anecdotes, but I don't want to take too too long. Take all the time. I've you got need. um I think eight pages here. So Jesus. we gotta we gotta all right, go, crack it out. Go on. Crack it out. New phrase. <laughs> so okay, so anyway. They're about 12 miles away from the shore. It takes about 30 minutes to swim. So to swim to shore would have been about six hours if they were not rescued. The two asthmat teenagers who are with them decide to make the swim to the Agats, which is Indonesia, um, that shore. They're trudging through the mud, the waves for hours and hours, and they finally actually make it and alert the officials when they arrived. When they did that, they left Wassing and Michael behind. So these two are left stranded and they're clinging to an overturned hull. Michael looked at Renee. I don't know how long this was that they were just waiting there, but Michael looks at Renee and he tells her, I think I can make it. Renee's like, hell no. (laughs) No, He cannot. (laughs) Michael stripped down to his underwear, fastened two jerry cans to himself to serve as life preservers and then jumped into the water and has not been, been seen since yeah or so we think wassing was spotted from the air the afternoon and was rescued the next morning the next morning it took them like 12 over 12 hours to rescue her why i have no idea why it took so long huh. I, I, okay. I don't could they just not find her yeah maybe. yeah that could be oh yeah because you don't want to be like driving around the ocean in the dark you could run over her yeah that'd be bad news yeah. but it's like if you see her from the air just throw her a rope (laughs) yeah yeah it seems like way too long but the ocean's big i don't know that's true um but as far as michael a missing rockefeller was big news the rockefeller family threw as much money at the situation as they could which is pretty much all the money there were ships airplanes helicopters covering the region for Michael or just any sign of him. Michael's mom and dad flew to New Guinea, but after nine days of looking, the Dutch interior minister stated, quote, there is no longer any hope of finding rock. I can't talk. <laughs> there is no longer any hope of finding Michael Rockefeller alive. Michael's dad thought that there could be a chance, but they still left the island. They were like, okay, well, if you say so, nine days is kind of a long time. We have other things to do. Definitely. I mean, if he doesn't, if he's not found at this point, he doesn't want to be found. I guess so. But it just <laughs> seems like you could have stuck it out for two weeks. Just a couple more days. I don't know. Nine I mean, days seems nine so days short. For looking for someone who's like lost at sea. And like, I know where this is going, so... That, like, makes me a little jaded. But they, like, yeah. didn't have any reason to think that he could get to shore. Like, a normal person can't swim for six hours. But the asthma teenagers did it. Because they're, like, a, living on the island. They're probably used to swimming in the ocean. He's yeah, that's not. true. That's true. Yeah. Two weeks later, the search was called off completely. Michael's official cause of death was drowning. But at that point, there was no end to the theories and the rumors in the media. Some said he was eaten by sharks. Some say he swam to the island or he was somewhere in the jungle trying to stay hidden um, and create his own life free of those. uh, What's it called? Like the golden handcuffs or you're in a golden cage. No way. No way. (laughs) (laughs) Who does that? Who has ever done that? No. And if he maybe he had like some fantasy of doing that, but real life sets in real quick and you're getting eaten by mosquitoes and you're hungry and you miss your Tempur-Pedic. I don't know how different he was or what he was truly like. It did seem like he was pretty artsy and more on the quiet side, pretty reserved. But I'd like to know how much money did play a role in his life and I mean what his lifestyle to, was like, like right like he could afford to just be like artsy and weird and do what he wanted but like that doesn't mean uh, that he, he's used to going like I feel like I don't know I feel like a lot of people have this fantasy like if you watch Survivor you see people who are like excited to go live in the wilderness and then they immediately realize they're not cut out for it <laughs> That would be me. I mean, I have no desire to live in the wilderness. No, because you're smart. But immediately, no. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Jeez, that was loud. The second blue alert today. What is a blue alert? Yeah, what's a blue I alert? I think it's an old 
person. I thought that was silver. Oh, I have no idea what a blue okay. one is then. <laughs> I'll look it up. Okay. Okay. So anyway, the Dutch all deny the rumors and they stick to the drowning story and his disappearance becomes a cold case. Now, in 2014, Carl Hoffman, a reporter for National Ge- Geographic, published a, his book, and this name is not great. He should have chosen a different title, but it's called Savage Harvest, A Tale of Cannibals, Colonialism, and Michael Rockefeller's Tragic Quest for Primitive Art. It is what it is. In his book, Carl claimed the Dutch were covering Wait, up- he wrote that recently? Yeah, in 2014. What the fuck? Yeah, Dude. <laughs> or actually the article I read came out in 2014. Oh, okay. It may have been like a couple years before that, but Still, yeah, it was in the 2000s. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's not good. All right. Not good at all. Um, in his book, Carl claimed the Dutch were covering up what was what really happened to Michael and that he had actually been killed by the Azmat people. I read an excerpt from his book, so that's where a lot of this information from here on out is coming from even in his boyhood the disappearance of michael rockefeller and the culture of the azmat people amazed carl so he decided to head out he got a boat pilot amadis an interpreter and some assistance to seek the truth about michael listen i was like five credits away from majoring in anthropology like i I, like, I get it, but also just, like, fucking leave people alone. Leave it alone. I don't get, like, if people clearly don't want to be messed with or talked to, fucking leave them alone. I don't understand. Yeah. We have conquered enough people and land and all of that shit. Like, yeah, just let people like, live let and let live. live. Yeah, exactly. It's, like, if, if people want to answer your questions and be communicated with and, like, have stuff written about them, sure. Then they will. But, but they clearly don't. <laughs> yeah. So get away, you yeah. weird ghost. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's literally. They think you're. <laughs> they're low key afraid yeah. of you because they Which, think you're a spirit. And fair enough, they should be afraid of you. Yeah, you're so right. You're so right. Um, nonetheless, the Azmats allowed them to stay in the village schoolhouse. Mm-hmm. And one evening, Amadis, who was um, of, from Azmat, he brought in his older brother. Kokai to the schoolhouse and he introduced him as his papa the head man from Pirion which was another Asmat village the man when asked how old he was he said he wasn't really sure but estimated himself to be in about his 60s Carl asked him if he remembered a story about a Dutch raid and men being killed because Carl had heard some history about Azmat battles and was curious to see how they could possibly connect the dots and if they had anything to do with Michael Rockefeller's disappearance. Kokai did remember this story and was a child when he saw it happen. A war between the Otsjanep and the Omadisep occurred. Those are two different Azmat villages. It occurred in September 1957, which is four years before Michael disappeared. The Omadisep leader convinced six, six Otsjanep men to accompany them down the river. These men from the two different villages were going in search of dog's teeth, which were both symbolic and held monetary value for them. So the Omadisep men ended up turning on the Ostinet men and they killed all of them, but one. Excuse me. The one who did get away crawled home through the jungle and he alerted his people. 124 Ostinet men set out for revenge. Only 11 of them returned home. This was not to, from what I've seen in the research I've done, it's not, out of the ordinary. I think this may have been more people who died um, as a result of this. But nonetheless, Max Lepri, the new Dutch government controller in Southern Asmat, said, no, 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 no. He was not pleased with the violence between the tribes. And he wanted to, quote, teach the Asmat a lesson. 
He led a tirade of officers to the Omadiset people and confiscated as many weapons as they could while burning their canoes. What the? the f- okay. Yeah. Okay. The Otsjanap were next, and they weren't going out without a fight. They had seen what happened with the other tribe, and they saw them coming. And they also made it clear that they were not um, looking to get along with the Dutch government. They're like, fuck you guys. Yeah. That means nothing to us. And fucking get off our island. What are you even doing right. here? We've been here. Yeah. So when they when the Dutch tried to kind of extend an olive branch to the Otsjanet people, um, which the gift they gave them was a Dutch flag. And some steel axes. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Would you trade your artifacts for a Dutch flag? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what a Dutch flag looks like. Um, I don't either. For some reason, I think it's red and white. Okay, I was picturing blue and white. Mm, I don't have know. a contest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the Austrian like people. This. Oh, oh, we're, we're both, both right. right. <laughs> it's red on the top, white in the middle, blue on the bottom. Yeah, we're it's so like a smart. Walmart French flag. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Speaking of blue, a blue alert is when a cop has been killed and they know who did it and he's on the loose. Oh. oh. Okay. Okay. Why would we get an uh, Never mind. That's the second one today. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. All right. Lay. Okay. Um, when Lepri and his men arrived at Otschenep, pandemonium began. This was the Asmats people's first experience with gunfire and the automatic violence that resulted in it was shocking to them. And they were super scared and retreated into the jungle. The Otschenep people were unsure what to do and... They were like, well, these white men are probably spirits and they are clearly pissed off. Like, we don't we don't know what to do. So they lingered there in fear of what would come from the spirits of the five white men that they did manage to kill when the battle broke out between the Dutch and the Otsjanet people. And after that, ever since then, the world had been out of balance because the asthma people have a very eye for an eye system. So if two people from their village are killed, then it's completely appropriate to go and kill two people from the village, you know, whoever killed yeah. their people. <clears throat> so there's a little background that Carl found out during his visit. Carl also met with another group of villagers and the vibe was off. Amadis told him everyone was afraid because, quote, there was a tourist who died here, an American tourist named... Carl couldn't understand Amadis very well. His English was um, not perfect, and Amadis had to repeat it several times. He had to slow down, but eventually Carl heard the name clearly, Michael Rockefeller. Carl never told Amadis he was there to investigate Michael's death, and Amadis told him they were afraid because they didn't want him asking about Michael. Carl asked him, why don't why don't we want to ask about Michael? Amadis tells him, Otsjanev killed him. Everyone knows it. So Carl learned more from a Dutch Catholic priest, Hubertes von Peishi? Peishi? <laughs> I don't know. Pei Pei P E J I Pei I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. And Hubertus? Hubertus? Okay. H U B E R T U S Hubertus is that? I I don't know. I don't know. Damn it, guys, you're supposed to tell me things. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Um so Hubertus, he spent a lot of time in Otsjanep and knew the people and the language very well. A month after Michael's disappearance, Hubertus was in a missionary house when four men, two Otsjanep and two Omadisep, walked in and asked if they could tell him something. He's like, yeah, of course you can. And they said that they were out one night on their way back from dropping off supplies at a government post when they spotted what they thought was a crocodile in the water. So they're like, okay, hell yeah, let's get some dinner. They look closer and sure enough, it was a man 
not only was it a man, it was a white man. The man is like waving for help and the Asmat people consider their options. If someone mistook me for a crocodile, I'd, I'd be, be real so offended. Pissed. I'd be <laughs> yeah. so pissed. I'm like, you think you're going to kill me? I'm going to kill you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like these braces were not cheap. You got to respect, <laughs> respect the jaws. Respect the teeth. <laughs> So they weighed their options. Should they kill him? Should they not kill him? One of the guys made a comment to the other guys like, oh, you always say you're a headhunter. Let me see you hunt some heads, essentially. And they were in disagreement. But one of the men, Pep, speared him in the ribs in front of everyone and then pulled him into their canoe. So they're like, okay, well, now we have this guy. <laughs> God um, damn it. <laughs> we were supposed to make this decision together. <laughs> um, and then they killed him. They started a large fire and allegedly drained his blood. They used that in ritual acts. Um, and Hubertus asked what the man was wearing. They're like, we had never seen what he was wearing before. He was just in these like very short shorts and he had glasses on. He looked like a real whore. <laughs> I mean, out here in the wilderness <laughs> like that? Come on, man. The men divided up the bones to use for hunting and fishing, and the skull hung in the house of Finn. They said that they killed him because of the killings in Otsjanep four years beforehand. And through Michael's death, they were restoring balance in the world. By consuming the body of Michael Rockefeller, they could absorb the energy and power that had been taken from them all those years ago. It's also speculated, and some sources say I couldn't get to the bottom of where this rumor came from, but it's speculated that some of the men who found Michael near the shore were actually the sons of some of the men killed by the Dutch three years earlier. Okay, so, I mean, that makes for a better story. Yeah, a little poetic justice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but little did they know they had killed this millionaire um, heir to the Rockefeller fortune, and most had never seen, uh, most asthmat people had never seen a helicopter before, an airplane. And so when the search for him began, it was terrifying. Also, there was a massive cholera outbreak in this region right after the search, and so many asthmat people died, they felt it was a consequence of killing Michael. So they swore to never speak of it to anyone ever again, just... Ignore your problems and they <laughs> will go away. Compartmentalize. <laughs> put that shit in a box, put it in the top shelf, cover it with a blanket. <laughs> Don't look at it. <laughs> Many asthmat people told this story the same way to Carl Hoffman, but no one ever came forward publicly to say, I was there, I took part in this. They just all knew about it. Yeah. Hubertus wrote um, all about this to his superiors, actually, when the Asmat men came in to see him. Um, he wrote it to his superiors and the regional government controller with this information. And the priest that Michael was actually planning to meet when he got to the island heard the same story and also wrote to the officials as well. But nothing ever came of it. They just swept it right under the rug. I mean, like, what can they really do? Like, you know, I guess but none of them should be there in the first place. The like, re Yeah, that's so true. And the reason why they swept it under the rug, people yeah. think, is because of colonialism. Um, they had already lost half of the island to Indonesia, and they didn't want it to seem like they didn't have things under control. Yeah. So it was all just swept under the rug. Church authorities warned the priest to stay silent. But a third Dutch priest did send a letter to the Rockefellers telling them of their son's fate. The Associated Press, I mean, talk about calling the press on yourself. Um, the Associated Press reported it, but the Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs responded that it was just rumors. And I mean, technically it is. Unless yeah. they do an investigation, which how is that even possible? You know? Yeah. I don't think we'll ever know yeah. for sure. Um, but on official record, it's mm -hmm. just a drowning. Yeah. That's our learning journey on Michael Rockefeller's disappearance. Wow. Very interesting. I'm glad you liked it. Um, if y'all have heard this before, 
Did you learn anything new? Uh, my sources are the story of Michael Rockefeller's death and the gruesome theories behind it by Gabe Paoletti and all that's interesting. What Really Happened to Michael Rockefeller by Carl Hoffman in Smithsonian Magazine and Michael Rockefeller's Wikipedia page. Well, thank you for You're that welcome. learning journey. Let's hear from our sponsor and we'll be RB. This episode is sponsored by Better Help. Without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy works. But what is therapy exactly? Girl, it's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships or at work, not dealing well with stress. Whatever you need, it's time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles and start feeling better because you deserve to be happy, obviously. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers a video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. Thank God. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It is always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And special offer to Night Classy listeners. You can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash classy. That is better, H-E-L-P dot com slash classy. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. And remember, Remember, supporting our sponsors supports us. So if you do decide to join BetterHelp, good for you. And remember to use that code CLASSY. We rolling? Yes. Hello. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. Um, well, hopefully my computer doesn't die before this lesson is over. Um, if it dies, do it's over. We're stopping where it is. You know what? I should have pulled it up on my phone before we started. That would have been a smart thing to do. But you know what? We're just going to fly just, by the seat of our pants. Yeah. Text each other our lessons. You just what? hear a bunch of like, click, 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 click. Click? <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm talking about us both being on our phones and instead of you talking... You oh, I meant lesson. I could read it from my Google Doc. I know. Oh. I'm just being dumb. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm the dumb one, I, I guess. <laughs> anyway, um, so like I said, this is one that gets suggested to us. Every time I ask for suggestions on Instagram, this always comes up. Um, and I don't know why, but you guys asked for it. Um, and it is interesting. Uh, so this is a lesson on crystals. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah. I feel like out of all of our night class theologists, yeah. we're behind the curve. Like we need to... At least I feel like I need to learn more about crystals. Yeah, I don't know a ton about them. I do have a lot of them. <laughs> I got a crystal from Dr. Dicey for yeah. our exchange that we did. We'll have to do that again this year because it was so fun. Um, but it it broke Ooh. like last week. But I looked it up and it's okay. Oh. It says that when that crystal breaks, I forget the name of it. I think it's like Labyrinth, maybe? Labyrinth? Lapis? I don't know. It starts with LAB. Okay. Um, but it means that that stone is there to help you through changes. And then once oh. it breaks, like all the pressure from like change is like done and released. And that's cool. Yeah. What changed for you? Um, my living quarters. Oh, that's true. Probably. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah. So we're talking about crystals. By definition, a crystal is matter that has an organized molecular structure. Um, I spent a lot of time reading what is a crystal. I still don't fully understand, but here's what I could derive. I think I get it at least this like basic understanding. And so I'm going to try to explain this to you guys. I'm sorry if you're like a gemologist or um, what someone who studies rocks. What are they called? Geologist. Geologist. Um, Rockologist. Rockologist. Wombologist. Rock and rollologist. <laughs> yeah. So bear with me here. So the atoms that make up a crystal are organized in some kind of regular or repeating grid pattern. And it's this like organized molecular structure, like geometrically, that makes a crystal. Math. And 
math. And I think when most of us think of crystals, we picture gemstones, yeah. but a lot of other things are crystals. So for example, snowflakes, table salt, sugar, like these things are also crystals. Table salt is made up of sodium and chlorine ions. Each sodium ion is surrounded by six chlorines and each chlorine is surrounded by six sodiums. And it's this repetitive structure that makes it a crystal. And this confused me because I thought everything had something like this, but I guess Does not. It not? Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't that That's what the internet told me. And what makes different types of crystals is both what molecule they're made of and how the molecules are arranged. So graphite and diamond, they're both crystals, both made of carbon. So both made of the same ion. Same, ion. same, but different. Same molecule. Yeah. However, the carbon is organized differently in each one. And that's what makes them so different because graphite and diamonds are two very different things. With graphite, you know, it's very soft. It's what pencil lead is made out of. And the carbon atoms are layered very thinly on top of each other in sheets, which is why it can be easily rubbed away to write with. But diamonds are hard. It's like one of the hardest materials we have and yeah it is <laughs> and they are formed deep in the earth under an incredible amount of pressure and what this does is it packs the carbon really tightly together which is why they're so hard they have a lot more bonds than the carbon of graphite okay okay you with me yeah 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 <laughs> yes I'm, <laughs> I'm totally here <laughs> yes and there are two main ways that mineral crystals form one is when pressurized molten carbon quickly cools that's how we get diamonds uh, the other is when liquid from a solution evaporates which is how quartz crystals like amethyst are formed did you ever get a crystal making kit as a kid no, I just got that noisy ass rock cleaning kit. <laughs> Those are awesome too, a rock tumbler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you got a crystal kit, the one I had when I was a kid, you could grow them in test tubes. And what it was is a solution and then it evaporates and leaves crystals. This is what we're talking about. Or if you've ever made rock candy. Yes. Yeah. You put yeah. the sugar in the water, evaporates, it makes a crystal. So that's how... Most, I think most gemstone crystals are formed that or extreme pressure. And so amethyst, for example, starts out as a concentrated solution of silicon dioxide and trace amounts of iron. The solution will typically get trapped in like a bubble of lava. And then as the water evaporates from that bubble, what you have left is silicon and oxygen ions, which arrange themselves into a crystal. And oh my God. they're purple because of iron. Can you imagine being an ion and going through all those changes? I'd be so scared. <laughs> like, oh, my God, we're in lava. Oh, my God, the pressure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, I was water and now I'm not. Yeah. A lot, a lot is happening. Wait, why, <laughs> why is iron purple? Um, well, it's just like it's a mineral. And I guess being mixed with like the the oxygen and the silicon, like it makes it purple. I don't know. Okay. You said it as if all iron is purple. No, not all iron is purple, but that's where amethyst <laughs> Shut gets up, its color Alec. from. Because uh, amethyst is just a type of quartz. Okay. And so like a lot of, I think a lot of gemstones are quartz, but they have like something else in them to give them a color. They're not, because like, you know, there's clear quartz, rose quartz, amethyst, whatever. Crystals can only grow if they have something to adhere to. For example, the inside of a lava bubble. And that's also where we get geodes. That's why you can get like oh, a fun. round rock and then break it open. And inside there's crystals. That was some, yeah. a bubble. I you used know? to love doing that. They're so fun. I fucking, I fuck with geodes. But also my anxiety was so high as a kid because I was, I was worried that a shard of the geode was going to go in someone's eye. Well, did that you wear goggles? Fear. No, we didn't wear 
wear oh, goggles? Well, yeah, I'd be scared too. You gotta wear goggles. We were just busting them raw wow, on the just driveway. Raw dog in the yeah, geodes. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah, no wonder you were scared. <laughs> For once, my anxiety was warranted. Yeah, that's that's deserved. You gotta wear goggles. <laughs> it's really hard to grow crystals on a smooth surface, which is why when you grow crystals in a test tube, you'll either put a string in there or you might scratch up the glass a little bit to give them something to hold on to. And I think the reason this topic gets suggested so much is because of the supposed healing properties and spiritual applications of crystals. So I'm done talking to you about science for the most part. We're going to focus most of our lesson today on um, the, the, healing. the fun stuff. Yeah. I will say there's a major lack of scholarly writing on the historic use of crystals. Um, it's really hard to find good sources on this. Most of them are either someone's blog or someone trying to sell you crystals. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it, it, it was tough. And also... But what, you what made am I it. To say? You made it happen. I did make it happen. And I will say if you're in school right now, like getting your doctorate in anthropology or history or something, like I think a really cool thesis would be like the historical application of crystals and healing because there's not a lot written about it. Um, but in any case, so the rarity and beauty of crystals and how they reflect light like is why I assume that people have been ascribing religious and magical properties to them for so long. Like they're beautiful. If you find this, no wonder you're going to think it's magical or definitely, spiritual. Definitely. Definitely. That was done with so many things. Yeah. So like that's divine. That's divine. That's divine. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, like you're digging through rock and dirt and then suddenly like there's this like sparkly thing that creates rainbows. Like, what of course fuck is it's that? magic. <laughs> yeah. The earliest documentation we have regarding the use of crystals goes back to the ancient Sumerians of Mesopotamia in 4000 BCE. Wow. Yeah. And Long I'm time. sure we've used like p crystals have been used before then. This is just like the ones we have. The Sumerians carved soft crystals like gypsum and hematite to represent important events in their lives, jobs, birth, marriage, religious ceremonies, and kind of like make a map of their life on a crystal. And that, we have some of those. I need that. Very cool. Ancient Egyptians adorned themselves with certain crystals in honor of certain gods and goddesses. So royal ladies often wore jewelry featuring crushed lapis lazuli stones in honor of Isis. Some ancient Egyptians were buried with quartz crystals on their foreheads to help them travel safely into the afterlife. And in my quest to find decent sources, I did find an undergraduate thesis by Christine D. Carlo from the University of Central Florida. So hey. shout out, Christine. She outlined three cultures that historically used crystals and where a lot of these new age Western practitioners derive most of their information and methods from. And these cultures she picked out are Indian, European, and Native American. And of course, there are a lot more cultures that have used crystals, that, like the Chinese especially come to mind. But these are the ones she outlined and where I'm going to spend most of my time. Because there's only so many sources. <laughs> exactly. And we only have so much time on this podcast. I got to go home, make hella fresh and watch The Sopranos. I'm sorry. Oh my God. <laughs> so we're going to start with Indian culture. Vedic religious texts from Northwest India dating back to 1500 to 500 BCE reference where certain crystals come from and what they mean. According to religious documents, Hindu demigods tricked the Vedic demon Vala into participating in, well, they told him it was a mock ritual sacrifice. Okay. Mm -hmm. He should have known I better. I mean, how often are they rehearsing rituals? <laughs> right, <laughs> with a demon. <laughs> Okay, everyone, get in position. <laughs> uh, so because Vala thought it was pretend, he allowed himself to be tied to a stake. Only That would be so scary. 
Yeah, well, he wasn't scared. He thought they were all having fun. I feel for him. He this thought. is rude. <laughs> so the demigods were not pretending. They actually dismembered him. And when this happened, his body parts became gemstones, which rained down onto the earth. When do you think he realized it was for realsies? Like at what point? I'm guessing when they started dismembering the first, him. The first limb? Or was it like, are we also rehearsing this part? Like you guys are just going to take one and then... No. Take the rest tomorrow. I think the actual thing. I think once he was tied up and yeah. realized like they weren't knows. playing around. Yeah. yeah. Like the I'm sure there was a vibe shift. <laughs> and it, it wasn't was good. Definitely <laughs> a vibe shift. Yeah. <laughs> so his uh, body parts are now gems and they fell down onto the earth and each one has certain powers in the Vedic religion. Ruby is Vala's blood, and that's associated with courage, sensuality, and removing sadness. Pearls are his teeth and have calming properties. Yellow sapphire is his skin. It helps with well-being and pregnancy. Hassanite is his fingernails and averts disaster and insanity and helps the minds of those working in sciences. So if you have like a scientist in your life, you should give them a piece of Hassanite. I'm sure the scientists would love <laughs> to get a crystal. <laughs> they probably would. I mean, who doesn't like a crystal? That's fair. Everyone loves a good crystal, whether or not you believe it has uh, powers. Healing powers. <laughs> Emerald is bile, which promotes psychic powers, learning ability, and clairvoyance. Diamond is bone and contributes to purity, creativity, and happiness. Blue sapphire is his eyes and wards off the evil eye and protects you while traveling. Red garnet, which is my birthstone, is toenails. Um, so oh, that's rude. My God, I love how they did toenails and bile for. <laughs> yeah, I think it's kind of. I think. Well, emerald makes sense for bile because it's green, but I'm not sure why Could red his garnet eyes. is the toenails. Yeah. Well, the blue sapphire is his eyes. Oh. But I'm also confused. Like, why is hessonite fingernails and then there's a separate garnet for toenails? Whatever. Which one is I'm not his, here to judge. You know. His dick? Yeah. I don't have that, but I do have his <laughs> semen. Okay. Um, okay. Which is, let's see, I believe it's a rock crystal. Um, nice. Yes, rock crystal is semen, and it does the same thing as pearl, which is promote calming. Jade is fat; it removes bad karma. And each gemstone fell in a certain place. For example, pearls fell into the ocean, ruby into the Ganges River, and if you get the gemstone from where it fell, it has more power. Like it's it's more powerful. In Ayurvedic religious practices, each crystal is assigned to a chakra, which aligns to a place on the body to like place the stone to best access its healing properties. And these methods are still used by modern Hindus who often pair crystal healing with meditation. Next, I have European paganism from around the 3rd century BCE until as late as the 17th century. Western astrology and paganism are closely linked, and certain minerals and stones are associated with certain planets. So, like, Mars mm. is iron, sun is gold, moon is silver, Mercury is quicksilver, Venus is copper, Jupiter tin, and Saturn is lead. And which crystals you might choose for your own healing depend on your astrology. Ooh, choose your own adventure. I know. I love it. I need to figure out which is my crystal. Yeah. Yeah. Probably go too. Probably our birthstones. Maybe that has something to do with it. I think sapphire is my birthstone. Ooh. So uh, let's see. For example, if your major star formations fall in line with the moon, you might choose a stone associated with the moon, like moonstone, selenite, pearl, and crystal quartz. And similar methods aligning astrology and crystal healing also exist in Ayurveda and Hinduism. So these things like are tend to like have a lot of similarities um spiritual practices with crystals across different religions um and in like new age spirituality and neo paganism they're often blended together and simplified and it like it, it kind of borrows mm -hmm. around from different cultures which can be really convenient because there is sometimes overlap like especially like meditation with crystals is a very common theme across pretty much every culture that uses crystals yeah i want to get some crystals i need to get my chakras 
checked out too. Yeah, that'd be fun. I want to do a little little chakra yeah, session. Let's do it. Let's go see Miss Monica. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of scared of Miss Monica. Me too. <laughs> let's not go see no. Miss Monica. <laughs> um, the third major cultural source of crystal healing is Native American, which is a very broad generalization as crystals are used differently across many different tribes. However, most modern influence um, in uh, like Western New Age spirituality comes yeah. from Cherokee and Apache traditions. Okay. And the two main themes of First Nations work with crystals are meditation and respect. These are the two most important things when it comes to crystal work. It is important to meditate on good thoughts and have a healthy mindset before working with crystals. And it's important to respect crystals as you should respect anything that comes from the earth. The belief is that... imagine that? You're supposed to respect the earth (laughs) and things that come from it. (laughs) What a novel concept. (sighs) Um, The belief that the earth, the belief is that the earth provides crystals for the purpose of healing and that each one contains a spiritual essence that should be honored. Stones might be carried or worn for their healing vibrations. Tinctures of stone may be made from water and ingested internally. And uh, certain New Age practices with crystals that were inspired by pagan or Eastern practices are not practiced and even considered dangerous by certain Native American traditions, especially Apache. So just because one culture or area of the world uses crystals in a certain way doesn't mean that everyone believes that you should. And I mean, this is where a lot of like criticism of neo-paganism comes in because like they'll be borrowing without realizing where it's coming from. And like in some places like that's dangerous, like certain things that you do. For example, the European practice of placing crystals on the ground in a geometric configuration and then sitting in the center to meditate that I think conjures up too much power or can and then also placing crystals directly on the chakra of the body especially using multiple crystals at once this is an eastern practice but not considered safe by some native american traditions interesting does Mm -hmm. not translate yes does not and i didn't put this in my notes but i think i also read that in uh, i believe and i might be wrong either cherokee or apache tradition when you're wearing a crystal amulet you can have more than one crystal in there at once, but they should not touch. And I think that kind of probably goes back to the, like, it's dangerous to just put a bunch of crystals on your body on all yeah. your chakras. Like, that's too powerful. I don't know if anyone has ever done this before, but I have an idea. I can't do it because I do not know enough about crystals. But if you are on TikTok and you know about crystals, <laughs> there should be a little series where the crystals, like, talk to each other and they each have their own personalities Ooh. based on what they do. That's fun. That could be very fun, I think. Yeah, I would watch that. It's <laughs> a tincture? Um, it's like a, like a drink you can make so you can like powder up, make powder of a crystal and then mix it with water and drink it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So while like certain things aren't done in certain religions, many practices do overlap between cultures and some experts think that that might be because they're so old, they might come and stem from a single source. Ooh, okay. Like a people have probably been using crystals and revering them as long as we have known about them, which is, you know, how could you not when we weren't animals anymore? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So the bottom line is crystal healing and the belief that crystals have power has existed for pretty much all of human history and across many cultures. Uh, Now, Modern paganism and Western New Age spirituality borrows from, simplifies, and blends together this wide range of beliefs and practices as it suits them. And I'm not saying this is necessarily bad, but I think it's important to learn about these beliefs, where these practices come from, and like whenever possible. It's not always possible to know where every single thing comes from because a lot of this is not documented very well, but you know, do your research, try to be respectful of the cultures this comes from and don't do anything dangerous. I don't know. Yeah, don't, don't let your crystals touch. Yes. <laughs> 
So how are crystals used in New Age belief systems? Today, crystals are often used as a form of alternative medicine. The idea is that they contain a healing energy and promote positive energy flow in the body while pushing out negative disease causing energy. I'm so pro crystal. I'm so pro crystal. Let it not be alternative medicine. Let it be additional medicine. Please still get vaccinated. Oh, definitely. <laughs> and like, I, I think crystals are like cool. And if they work for you, that's great. But yeah, they but cannot you know cure about, your cancer. Right? Like you need to go to a doctor. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm sure our listeners know this. Like I'm not trying to be like insulting you guys' intelligence. But yeah, no. It, but it's good to say. We have it's a good reminder for all of us. People from TikTok <laughs> coming over and, and yeah. listening. Um, so I just want to make it very clear. Yes. <laughs> and so this... This idea of, uh, you know, healing with these positive energies, a lot of this stems from Hindu and Buddhist concept of chakras. And a lot of like there are alternative doctors that are like Hindu and Buddhist and you can go to them for this kind of stuff. There's also I mean, there's a broad range of types of people who yeah, practice with crystals. So many doctors. Yeah. <laughs> And stones in the color of their respective chakras will be placed on chakra points in the body. So above the head, on the forehead, throat, chest, stomach, gut, and genital area. Certain stones and positioning can be adjusted based on what symptoms a person has that the healer is trying to help with. For example, amethyst is supposed to help the intestines, green aventurine the heart, and yellow topaz for mental clarity. Stones also may be worn on the body or placed under a pillow to expel negative energy or attract the energies you want. And different crystals, quote unquote, do different things. Crystals thought to promote health are clear quartz, jasper, obsidian, amethyst, and bloodstone. For wealth, you want tiger's eye, citrine, turquoise, sapphire, and jade. And okay, for, I need all of those. Yeah. <laughs> Add two carts. <laughs> and for love, rose quartz, moonstone, and ruby. And the idea behind this is that crystals each have their own energy and put out different vibrations, which can interact with our bodies. According to crystal healer Sonali Sujani, quote, crystals are made up of different elements or compounds, which our bodies react with in different ways. Crystals are minerals that hold energy, and we as humans are made up of energy. We can exchange energy with the crystals we work with. She says that crystals contain an electric charge and cites a 2008 study that found quartz can be used to start a fire, like used in place of flint, and can generate electricity. Um, yeah. She's saying it has energy inside because it sparks when you hit it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's electric. Okay. That's what she says. So That's a it's study a with air quotes? Well, it is a study that uh, some crystals can conduct an electric charge. And okay. I think that's what she's citing um, as uh, evidence that they have energy. So with that being said, there have not been many scientific studies. that <laughs> She's like, no, you don't get it. They have an energy about them. Yeah. It's a vibe. I feel good when I look at the pretty ones. <laughs> Yeah, and like I don't want to like shit on every anybody's beliefs, but if we're looking at this from a scientific standpoint, uh, there the, may not be electricity in <laughs> them. <laughs> the power that crystals have lies in the human mind, aka the placebo effect. Beautifully said. Yes. So a 2001 study had 80 participants fill out a survey to assess their level of belief in the paranormal. They then were asked to meditate for five minutes while holding a quartz crystal. Half of the participants held real quartz and half held a glass imitation. Afterward, the participants answered questions about the sensations they felt while meditating with the crystal. People reported odd sensations, tingling, heat, vibrations, especially if they were primed in advance and told that that would happen. <laughs> I need to placebo my way into having Adderall. <laughs> <laughs> I my mean, 
psych appointment comes up. I need yeah. to placebo myself on a lot of things. Yeah. And I mean, it, the, the placebo effect is powerful. Yeah. Like just because there's not science that says the crystals are doing this doesn't mean they don't work because the human mind is very, very strong. She never stops working. That's that right. That human mind. <laughs> We're so smart. Um, especially so those who tested high in paranormal belief also experienced much greater sensation from the crystals. Oh than my those God. who tested low. <laughs> we need to start meditating with crystals I know. every recording I'm session. <laughs> <laughs> I almost brought mine today and then I was like, you should have. And then I forgot. So the study concluded that crystals are powerful because of the power of suggestion. And of course, the placebo effect is powerful. So crystal work really could have positive outcomes for that reason. A 2008 BMJ study found that about half of doctors report using placebo treatments to help their patients. That's rude. (laughs) But I mean, if it works, it works. Like the example they gave is prescribing like Advil or a vitamin supplement, you know, stuff that like probably won't have major effects on whatever this person is like afflicted with. But it like it The placebo effect is strong and it can trick you into feeling better, which I mean, if it works, it works. If it works, it works. But for a doctor, like I don't, if I'm taking the placebo, make sure my insurance covers it all. Right. (laughs) Obviously they like give real treatment too, but it like, you know, like if you're looking for an immediate fix or like, what can I do right now? Oh, buy some vitamin C. Like it doesn't hurt you. It probably does something good, but like, it's not going to like cure you yeah but it might make you feel better and it might make you feel like you're at least doing something which I think is worth it so I mean if crystals do that for you like totally go to a crystal healer like in addition to like uh, a medical doctor yeah yeah just cover all the bases yeah and I mean people also like just hold crystals while they meditate it helps ground them it might give you something to focus on like if you want to attract love you might hold a piece of rose quartz while you meditate and it just like helps focus your meditation like there are definitely really good and I think beneficial ways to use crystals. I agree. Just because like scientific studies have shown that it's the placebo effect doesn't mean like that they're stupid and you shouldn't use them. Absolutely. Like, yeah, I, I don't want you to think that that's like, <laughs> Oh no, I, okay. I know that's not what you're saying, <laughs> okay. but I also feel like <laughs> people are so quick to like shit on crystals and like call it stupid. And it's like, okay. Like I think most people know that like they're not literally absorbing their vibrations and healing their disease but you know it can help focus you it can help ground you it can help like bring you some positive energy whether that's the placebo effect or not so i think they're really cool and i think if you use crystals you should keep using them i think uh, just to Haley's point i feel like we live in a time where medical disinformation is so prevalent yeah that that's why you have to be careful oh definitely and i'm not saying that like you, I think you guys know what I'm saying. Yeah, but yes. you just said the majority of people probably assume this. I think there's a lot of people That's out there right true. now that COVID has proven the majority do not. <laughs> I mean, but I don't think those people listen to this show, do they? If you well, do, you never know. I just yeah. feel like you can't assume people yeah, you can't, know this stuff. You can't eat a piece of citrine instead of taking a vaccine. Like that's not what we're saying. You um, can't drink bleach and COVID <laughs> goes away. Shockingly, well, that's not dead. how it works. Yeah, guess <laughs> that's true. Um, so yeah, that was my lesson. I had fun researching this. Thank you to those of you who suggested. Yeah, that was so topic. fun. Yeah. I love listener requested stories. Me too. They always knock it out of the park they really it's a do good time my sources are and hold on to your butts there's a lot uh, <laughs> <laughs> crystal healing stone cold facts about gemstone treatments by elizabeth palermo and jonathan gordon on lifescience.com you asked do his do healing crystals actually work by markham hyde on time.com healthline.com what is a crystal by ava amson on let's talk science.com what is a crystal by Anne marie helmenstein on thoughtco.com an in-depth look at the history of crystals and healing by michael harrison on cosmiccuts.com crystal healing practice 
Practices in the Western World and Beyond by Christian D. Carlos of the University of Central Florida and the Historical Vedic Religion Wikipedia page. And that was my lesson. Um, Thank you for that. That was a whole lesson in itself just here in the sources. <laughs> I know. Well, thank you all for sticking around if you did. Um, and if you stuck around, uh, thank you. That's very kind of you. You must really like us. So make sure we, you... Uh, we really like you too. We do. <laughs> and, um, you know, just like uh, pay, show us some love by uh, rating, reviewing, <laughs> and subscribing <laughs> on every... <laughs> Have you seen, you haven't seen the new season of 90 Day Fiance? No, There's I haven't. a guy on there named Muhammad, and he talks in this like really high pitched like baby voice. And oh, it's not so the baby funny. voice. Why are you wearing a bikini? <laughs> oh, <laughs> He no. talks like that. I kid you not. And it's not his accent. Like he just has a like weirdly soft like, high pitched voice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that song has always <laughs> creeped me out. <laughs> yes. It's, he, uh, he could uh, do a great job on karaoke sometime with that song. But yeah, so that's <laughs> who I was channeling um, with that voice. But anyway, remember to rate, review, and subscribe anywhere you can. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your coworkers, tell your mom, everyone about the podcast. And, you know, donate to us on Patreon. Join us for our next cocktail hour. Listen to the bonus content. It's a good time over there. As always, thank you for listening. We love you. And three, two, one, class dismissed. dismissed.